let's take a minute and do that. Part of Unitarianism is really about getting to know each other, uh, sometimes stating the obvious, like you belong here, uh, starts a conversation, uh, you know, and, the, and, and begins more questions, you know, so what are you here for, and why are you here, <laughs> and what's belonging about. It's actually a lot of fun being a service leader and having a topic like belonging, because, you know, do a little research and, and through the week. Um, one story I saw this week was on an online newspaper. Um, it was a story about belonging, was a headline. And that people who do the kind of things that uh, happened in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas just, just a short while ago were, were pe are people who are lonely, that don't belong. And the actual cure for us moving together as a society in a healthy way is to belong and is to share. And for those of us that know that, uh, the, the, the health benefit, the mental and physical health benefits of belonging to things, uh, knowing that we need to reach out to those that don't and, uh, and um, invite them to have that same benefit. So today's topic, belonging, and I also found out there is a word belongingness still trying to figure out how to put it in a sentence, but belongingness. We share belongingness. Go back one. Um, belonging, are you talking about the gunman didn't belong to anything? Yeah. yeah. In Las Vegas. Well, okay. he was, he was, and folks that do things that are really horrific like that are typically loners. Okay. That's yes. my point. Did okay. you get that? I didn't get anything. No. So I didn't feel that he belonged. He wouldn't no. have felt like, if he had a belong, if he had to belong to something, a supportive group where he could have expressed how he felt or uh, what was going on and gotten the help he needed a different, uh, he'd be unlikely that he'd be less likely. Less likely. So what I did was I looked at belonging and the reason we're doing, I'm doing the topic belonging is because in two weeks we're doing a joining membership belonging ceremony here and uh, it's, it's really a milestone that for this group that's been meeting almost 20 years, uh, more, yeah, that we're going to become a Unitarian congregation and uh, in two weeks everyone's welcome to come and support those that want to join and we'll have a ceremony, a spiritual joining as well as an official signing and, of a book and, and a celebration after. So and a workshop on the Saturday before. And everyone is welcome. Everyone's welcome, whether you choose to join or not. There is also another uh, uh, level of those that want to come and participate but don't want to join, that, that uh, a, a friends, uh, like an associate uh, of Unitarians. And, and we'll explain that uh, as well as we go along. And is all this going to happen here or at your house? Well, there's a flyer on it, and there's a workshop on Saturday, the 21st, and uh, That's here. at 2 to 4 here, and then a potluck dinner celebration in the evening, and then Sunday is a regular time service here, where we'll do the ceremony. And we have Minister Deb Thorne coming from New Westminster, she's been here before. They, they are our mentor, have been our mentoring congregation, Unitarian congregation, for a number of years. And we, we just met this week to work out the details for for two weeks from now. And one of the things that I pointed out was that there's a number of members, who has been a Unitarian before here? Okay, so we've attracted, you know, people who are, have a history of Unitarians, 
and there's other people who have never, who may or may not be joining, but it's also people for the first time becoming unit, declaring that they're Unitarian will be participating in this. So, be, it's a, looking forward to it. On this, this uh, presentation, this service, I looked at uh, and I got ideas around what's belonging from a number of sources. A Unitarian minister from Texas, uh, Deb Thorne uh, from New Westminster, BC, um, Reverend Peter Morales from Boston, a sermon from Brian Kelly in uh, United Church of Edmonton, uh, a Reverend Ann Pert from uh, the United Kingdom, Lyle Scheller, who was an American parish consultant, author, and workshop leader, and we'll hear from you. Hopefully, we'll have some time to talk. I'm just giving you the sources of where I got some information, some different people who who contributed to this service and what's belonging, their ideas. And I just want to read uh, something. This is from uh, Reverend jo Joanne Fontaine from. Uh, Live Oaks Unitarian Church in Texas. And I guess it's a poem, kind of. And it's, it explains a little bit about what it means to be Unitarian. Every third Tuesday, I am a Baptist. <laughs> I empty my mind and lighten my heart and try to let go of attachments. Every other Friday, I'm a Christian and try to love God and my neighbor. The full moon of the month finds me Wiccan I honor the dual nature of God and find my rhythm as maiden, mother, or crone. On the 15th of the month, I'm a humanist. I respect science, integrity of fellow humans, and all that we have learned and have made. Every fourth Wednesday, I am Hindu. I take a breath and understand, and what is unfinished now will remain for me to continue next life. On alternate Fridays, I'm Jewish whispering prayers to my children, softly touching each head. On Thursday and the Mondays and the Saturdays and Sundays and all the other days in between, find me reading or listening or watching philosophers, Muslims, Mormons, Baha'i, and more. Fill my heart and touch my soul. And yet, the one thing that none of these provide to me is a certitude that they are the one. They lend me wisdom, sing to my heart, cause me to question, help me to find answers, make me more me. And at the end of the day, every day, I am Unitarian Universalist, in parcel and in pledge. And with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and all my strength, I honor this faith. I hold it close as it lets me run free. Um, from Deborah Thorne, who will be here in two weeks conducting the service, um, she talks about Unitarians tend to be an interesting mix of joiners and non-joiners. Some Unitarians express their commitment to live the seven principles by supporting their congregation financially, sharing skills by taking leadership positions, volunteering for jobs big and small, or showing up regularly on Sunday morning. Others see themselves without question as being Unitarian, belonging to the people who are both rational and intuitive, who seek for answers and can live contently in the tension of having no definite answers and really join a congregation. And uh, it really, belonging to a Unitarian congregation is a really hard thing to describe when you consider what it means. <laughs> and it's actually that uh, ambiguity or inability to describe ourselves as part of who we are uh, as Unitarians. One of the things that uh, they spent in New Westminster, a whole month, September's theme is belonging. And Deb uh, challenged her congregation to uh, do some exercises. One uh, they, is this month, let's send messages of positive reinforcement to the people who make us feel like we belong. At church, at home, at work, take a moment, write a small note to people about how they make you feel included, special, and what they do to make you feel this way. She's asking, and I'm asking, try that. That's belonging. Invite someone to an activity this month, whether it's coming along to a worship service or going to a dinner, participating in a book, a book group or hike, going for a hike. Offer a personal invitation to someone to draw them in and reflect on or share with your other 
members in this group how you feel specifically about including someone. How does that make you feel? So again, as a Unitarian, uh, we don't just do Sundays and we do through the week. We meet on Tuesdays or, and you can sometimes get instructions on a Sunday to try and practice being Unitarian and that's what she's done here. Just a little bit about the science. Belonging. Why do we need a sense of why do we need a sense of belonging? One of the many things that's common in humans across cultures is the need to belong and be accepted by others. This is one of the reasons people seek to spend time bonding with family, friends, hobby buddies, sports fans, religious congregations. Whenever I found myself musing aloud why we have this need, the answer I received is because humans are social animals. But why are we social animals? Why do humans need to belong? Let's get something straight. First, do we really need a sense of belonging? The answer is yes. Social psychologists have been studying our need for belonging for well over a century, and one of the most famous studies on the subject was done by Abraham Maslow, who in 1943, and you've probably heard of this before, proposed that the human need to belong was one of the five basic needs. And there's a triangle that we've sort of probably seen in high school somewhere in psychology class, and they talk about food, and shelter as our most basic needs. I mean, you can't think about much else if you don't have food and shelter. You're thinking about how to get food. You're hungry or you're cold or those or that. And the next thing on the list, once you have those things satisfied, is the need to belong, the need to join with others in uh, survival, really. And when you belong to something, uh, you're then settled enough to begin to grow to the next level, which is growing your consciousness and your awareness and working together to make a better place for everyone. So he's saying on that list of five, this triangle of, of needs, that belonging is just about food and shelter. In fact, without belongingness, oh here it is in a sentence. <laughs> As we will see without belongingness, not only would we never make it past infanthood, but it's likely that we would be nowhere near as evolved as we are today. Think about how much we've all learned by belonging to different groups and uh, people that came together with, with the desire to learn and grow and, and evolve. Coming together as we do each week as a faith community is an expression of our desire to be together, to belong to something bigger than any of us. It may be a time to pause and hit the reset button. Our Unitarian Universalist faith does not ask us to leave our skepticism or our doubts at the door. It does not ask us, ask to place our trust in supernatural beings, doing supernatural things. It does not ask us to believe 21 impossible things before breakfast. <laughs> It allows each of us to hold our own views about religion and religious ideas. It allows us to change or refine our views as our lives take us toward different truths, deeper ways of interacting with life itself. Here, we do not need to think alike to belong. That's pretty amazing. I don't know how many groups are like that, but you don't need to think alike to belong. We're free to follow our search for truth and meaning in the company of others who provide encouragement. If you join with Unitarian Universalism, you can hold any opinion you want about the existence of a God or what you or what to call that God. You can change your opinion over time. You can follow your conscience, your readings, your thoughts, your desires on issues like the existence of an afterlife, the idea of sin, the value of prayer, or authority of religious texts. Having set aside divisive doc doctoral battles, we seek a straightforward commitment to the fluid, open, collective work of seeking our truths together without assuming that we will all share the same truth. Our faith is a practice of intellectual humility, reminding us of our own limitations. Our faith assures us that we are not alone and that we can be part of something greater than ourselves. The journey is the joy. The companions are the comfort, and the work is the faith. Just being in that, in this space of those differences, is the work. So this is the sermon, a piece of the sermon from uh, Brian Kelly. Uh, 
Unitarian Church of Edmonton, which is where Keith is today. He's in uh, in Edmonton. Uh, it's kind of nice to know that you know when you're part of a Unitarian congregation, there's other groups like this meeting around the country and in Canada, United States, and and Europe. sometimes talking about the same Europe and sometimes talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. And as you travel, you know, as a Unitarian, you can visit, and we have visited uh, different Unitarian uh, services. You can drop in, and they, they'll yep, they'll welcome you with open arms. And pick a Billington. <laughs> there is an old joke that, like many such treasures, makes a nice point. A Unitarian minister moved to the Deep South. The Ku Klux Klan was incensed. So one midnight, they turned up in front of her house and burned a question mark on her lawn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether the jokes originated inside or outside our faith, but I'm rather proud of it. Why? Well, for one thing, the question mark suggests our openness to the kinds of uncertainty and fundamentalist religions, the fundamental religions detest. We're open to that kind of uncertainty. We are not people so desperate for security that we will believe absurd, unprovable, and insupportable ass assertions about a God just so we can feel better. Secondly, it speaks to the courage sometimes required by our faith to stand up against the powers of evil. Here in Edmonton, the challenge is not really evident, but there are places in the world where being a Unitarian does take a measure of courage. I was once invited to be the minister of a congregation in the Deep South. I had to accept that call. Had I, had I accepted that call, I would have had to cope with losing a parishioner in the bombing of an abortion clinic. The man was a volunteer escorting women through the protest picket lines. He was living his faith. There are places where living our liberal beliefs is dangerous. And finally, the joke reminds us that as Unitarians, that is, as people who choose to come to church, we choose to accept living in the margins. How many people come to church? At Unitarian uh, Symposium, Reverend Anne Pert of the UK delivered a paper on marginality. She wrote, to be on the margin voluntarily is a form of dissent, but it is also to acknowledge a continued relationship with that which is different. It is not separatism. There are two important characteristics of marginality. Firstly, that it is always in relation to the center, and secondly, that it is complex in that each individual life contains experiences of, of both marginality and centrality. In our case, we choose diff two different kinds of margins. First, we are on the margin of North American religion expression in that we allow all the expression of religion within our community. Although some parts of the United States move closer to our views over the last few decades, so we're making some progress, Unitarians would say. Our unwillingness to make a definite statement about the existence of a God makes us unique. To a few of my colleagues in other traditions still make offhand remarks that Unitarianism can't possibly cons be considered a real religion. And there are still occasional objections to our inclusion in various interdenominational events. But the second area of marginality we embrace is that our general pattern of social and spiritual views are a little weird in Canada because we do go to church. <laughs> and just uh, one more thing. One is a, a membership, you know, what's it mean to belong? You join, everyone's joined something sometime in their life. And, you know, you join school, you join <coughs> clubs that are social and, and clubs that are recreational. And, uh, and this, is a, this is a spiritual, my spiritual home, where I join for uh, the support of others as uh, we go through our uh, moments of hell or moments of joy. And, uh, and, and somehow it makes it easier. Unitarians' uh, membership is a process. Though there are organizational and institutional needs to define membership cleanly and precisely, the process of membership is, in reality, a gradual process from lesser to greater commitment, which neither begins nor ends at the point of formal joining. <laughs> I like that. We've already begun uh, joining and being members whether you like it or not, you're here. <laughs> so it, 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 that is just marking a point in a journey of membership as a process. Thus, for both the individual and the institution, the meaning of membership changes over time. Both are continually in process. 
but neither it is neither a smooth nor entirely predictable process. Community is a happy sounding word and it's common for religious liberals to emphasize the ideal of community as primary reason for and purpose for an institution of church. Such idealism has its place, but building an authentic human community is never easy and only fleetingly happy. <laughs> the broad appeal of the word itself suggests that the, it's actually included in many congregations that community as a word as something that we're trying, trying to join. It's, it's become more popular in, the, in names and within church um, in, in a way to boast that you don't have a community and a feeling of community that the members would enjoy. The dream of some is that by placing the magical word in the name will both reinforce the sense of community and attract those seeking a supportive community. But magic cannot create the warm, fuzzy ideal that most people associate with community. Real community can only be built through hard and unglamorous work. Like any effective relationship, it requires commitment. Often these days we hear people say they are seeking a spiritual community but want nothing to do with organized religion. By the former, they seem to mean a place that will meet their own religions, religious needs, and the latter, they seem to associate with a place that will make demands upon them to support the institutional needs. The reality is that you cannot have one without the other. And part of the church's job is to lead people to the discovery of the spiritual truth that it is only by giving that we receive. Giving not only our money, but ourselves. In other words, only by making a commitment to a community can we hope to build a community. And this commitment consists not only of lofty idealisms, but practical realities. The process of membership is in reality a gradual progression from lesser to greater commitment. Take a breath. <laughs> um, what I have is I'm going to pass the, uh, an, an envelope. I like to do this when I do a service. And, and, and I have quotes in here from people. And so pass it around and take whatever you would like and read it to yourself through. And then I'm going to ask you to read the quotes from uh, uh, these different people about what belonging means to them. And hopefully that will begin a a bit of a discussion at some point around. Yeah, just, and I don't think there's enough for everyone, so if you don't feel like taking one, that's okay too. You can pass, it, pass on it or take it, whatever you like. So read it through so you're familiar with it. And when you're ready, go ahead and share. May I? Sure. Sometimes our light goes out, but is blown into flame by an encounter with another human being. Each of us owes the deepest thanks to those who have rekindled this inner light. That's by Dr. Albert Schweitzer a member of the Church of the Larger Fellowship, Unitarian Universalist. Thank you, Albert. Would you, would you read it again? I would. Sometimes our light goes out, the light inside us, but is blown into flame by an encounter with another human being. Each of us owes the deepest thanks to those who have rekindled this light, this inner light in, in us. And I, when I chose that one, I almost didn't because it says our light can go out and I don't believe that. I think our light can, can I think our light can, can get, get dim. dim and then <laughs> being belonging and being in a group, you know, sometimes we don't even know our own light is dimming, you know, because we're in it. And it takes a group to bring us bring that out and be able to talk about something. Thanks for sure. Who's next? I'll go ahead. I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the community, and as long as I live it, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. George Bernard Shaw. Thank you. 
can comment on it if you read it and say, you know, that's bogus or or uh, that's uh, I really like this or however, whatever you want to comment, it's fine. All well. There's a for me whether it's a micro situation between between a friend and myself as an example that with that relationship, um, it needs to be reciprocal. So it doesn't just happen. I mean, we both have to deal with each other and our strengths and our foibles and our interests and our lack of, of similarity. And, and that's where we, I found, that's where I grow. I grow from what um, buttons get pushed, I get um, aware of the gratitude that I feel for someone else. And at the same time, whether that's just with, within one person to another, it's even more so when it's a community. You know, I hear people so often speak, oh, I'm so happy I belong to this group, whatever this community group is. Um, and it's because of the willingness of others to give. And so for me, I find at times that um, I need to really make sure that I feel reciprocal mm -hmm. in community in order to really be, not to do it from a place of obligation, but do it from a place of love, like that desire to want to. Mm -hmm. So for me, the community has to be one where that's reciprocal sense of, it's not, it's not based in duty or a sense of responsibility as much as it's in love. Sometimes I, I find uh, there's a big welcome for new members to, to some groups. And then it's sort of, it's really a big welcome for new members that once you are a member, it's sort of like you're not the new member anymore. <laughs> So that's, that's interesting too, as a group, you know, how and how do you do that? How do you remain and belong and, uh, and, and have that balance of giving and receiving? Thank you. Can I read one too? So this is by Henry Nelson Wyman, 1884, 1975. Thanks. This one's This one's by Henry Nelson Wyman, 1884, 1975, an American philosopher and a theologian. In the ceremony for new member welcoming, which I have written, are these words. Joining ourselves to and with the members of this congregation should call forth deep motives and commitment. For this group of people is the visible sign of the ideal community of love and life in which, and toward which, the whole body of humanity is ever bound. With our doubts, fears, pettiness, and laziness, as well as our courage, insights, patience, and determination, we are the existing proof that humanity can achieve a world growing toward peace, though it be composed of separate and often differing personalities. Very obviously. Why don't you pass the mic down and then we'll just go right around. Uh, not if you don't want to. <laughs> well, um, this here is by John O'Donoghue. And it says, in contrast to how a child belongs in the world, oh, I get sad. Adult belonging is never as natural, innocent, and play or playful. Adult belonging has to be chosen, received, and renewed. It is a lifetime's work. When I get sad about uh, how a child belongs in the world, I'm sure there are many children that don't have the feeling that they belong in the family or in the world. And it uh, makes me think, did I belong when I was a child? Did I belong in the world, or did I belong in my family? It makes me think. I'm not sure. Right. I'm just sure that I very much have the uh, urgency and the necessity to belong. And I think that's one of the reasons why I ended up in Nelson. It's easier to belong in Nelson. We are kind of more 
the togetherness tone and a lot of other tones are in the I think that's yeah like I always felt that I didn't belong in the school because I felt like I was different All right. and, and uh, so um, that's why I finally was kicked out of school actually <laughs> So there we go. All right, well, glad you're here. Glad to, yeah. Glad you're here. Yeah. Thank you. This is from Reverend John Burns, president of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Do you want to hold it closer? Oh, no, no. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> to be human is to be religious. To be religious is to make connections. On some more along that vein, and we don't quite understand religious in quite that way. We, religion is more spelled out that you have to believe in, but as Unitarians, I think we're more in defining what's in our hearts spiritually rather than what goes into our minds religiously. Anyway, that's. Uh, Something to think about. Thank you. Maya Angelou, I long, as does every human being, to be at home wherever I find myself. Um, and I have just spent the last two and a half years interviewing people, mostly elders about their sense of home in, inside and outside. Um, and since I was on the road uh, on a tour a week ago, this was this quote, this saying, really struck home to me, um, that wherever I went in different communities, um, it, sometimes it was a challenge but to feel that belonging and that connection. So a little bit more, in particular, in Invermere, somebody got up and said something that just instantly leveled all ages and generations. Here's what it was. Um, my daughter, who's a designer for a project I did, is 31, came with me on the tour. And I was in Invermere in a library filled with seniors um, talking about aging and creative approaches. And unexpectedly, I said to her across the room, and she's the only young one there, and I said, um, what have you learned from this tour, from your perspective as a young person, about growing old? And she got up, beautiful 31-year-old, and said, we're all children. We all have a child place that responds to life and reaches out to life. Um, and some of us have more wrinkles than others, but we're all children, and everybody smiled. Everybody. Suddenly that connected everyone in a sense of recognition and home. I, I was thinking, Lee, that that message that you picked randomly actually belonged to you, <laughs> for you to, to say, and it found you, or you found it. Yes, for all of us, yeah, that's the truth. When we belong, we believe. When we separate, we doubt. And no one. And um, I, I'm not sure if it's true. So I, I am. Yeah, I'm not sure. And I feel like this one was chosen for me as well, or I chose it. Uh, Spirit of life, remind me of my deep belonging to this world. May I know in my bones my true place in the family of earth. Just as the roots of a tree belong to the soil and microbes, and the branches of that tree belong to the wind and birds that come to perch, may I know my own deep roots and wide branches as belonging to a greater forest of love. 
Barbara Ford. Thanks, Alex. So I'm just going to, lots to think about belonging. I'm uh, just going to finish my presentation with a prayer. So get comfortable, however you listen to a prayer, you go ahead and do that. Belongingness. As a practice, Unitarians admit that we have not yet perfected all of what we promise. We are, however, always engaged in doing our best. And we know that there will be times when we could be better. When that happens, we stop and make amends and make necessary adjustments. Then we begin again in love. Belonging isn't about being perfect. It's about being authentic and being engaged with others in love, service, for justice, and peace. And this practice is what we promise each other when we come together. It is what we offer to those who seek a place of spiritual exploration and belonging. In this world of separation and alienation, we seek comfort and meaning. We want to know and be known. We want to experience something greater than the sum of our individual lives. We may call that something God or love or cosmic energy, or the ground of being, or creation, or the big bang, or stardust. By whatever name or character, it comes to this. We belong. Come, whoever you are, come just as you are. You are welcome here. Blessed be, and so be it. Thank you. cards in the basket that explain the seven principles of uh, Unitarianism. If you're new or interested, take a card as well. wonderfully appropriate song both for today and also for um, our belonging ceremony as well. And Dale and I have been playing it over and over and over again looking for the right speed of somebody else's performance that uh, makes it more possible for us to sing it together. Excuse me. I'm, I'm going to, instead of having my closing, well, I'll have closing words later, but in, in that process, as I said the words to the song and sung it with the different, audience, different choirs and such that we were listening to, I, I had a realization last night, and I talked to Dale about it, because the words of this song um, could be sung by anyone, even those people who are uh, akin to Al-Qaeda and ISIS, they, they too could have a fire of commitment, but perhaps their purpose is not um, as generous as ours, which is why we'll look in closing words at the seven principles for what is this fire of commitment all about. On your single sheet of paper, it has Michael Daly's uh, bio on it. 
<coughs> you'll find the music. And Dale has found the very perfect uh, background music to help us sing this song. Uh, the question is by the uh, And it's by, by the, the composer. actual composer, the person who composed this song, J Jason, Jason Shelton. And um, so, please stand as you are able and willing. is all about. I'm just going to quickly read um, the Unitarians envision and work to build a community and, a co and are collectively are guided by seven principles. The first principle is the inherent worth and dignity of every person. The second, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Third, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregation. The fourth principle, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Fifth, 
the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. The sixth principle, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. The seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Mm -hmm. And so when you have the seven principles, you can, I, I can full, put my full voice to the song of the fire of commitment and not worry about what other people might do with that. <laughs> and so that brings us to a close. Um, and I should know not to trust you. Okay, I'll take it off. Here, take it off. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. I, I'm good. I just, I had gotten caught. Excuse me, I just want to say that I'm not feeling that that's so why I'm sitting there. That it's no statement is being made that I don't Oh, 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 not taking a knee. Not taking a knee. Taking a seat. Thank you. She's she's not taking a knee. <laughs> Just keeping her seat. Yeah, you're a football player, then. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so we are missing our. Oh, it's not there. Oh, block. Um, we are suspending the chalice flame. If anyone can think of a better word, we are not dousing it. We are not dispersing, dispersing it. Suspending it. We are suspending it at this moment until we come back together again. But it continues to live in the hearts of every person. And um, so the fire of commitment and the flame of grace and beauty exists in everybody's heart. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot that. Okay, we'll see. Okay. And um, okay, and and as I blow out the candles, um we can all blow out the candles, but... Um, are there some announcements? There are. Uh, the first announcement that I will make, and that's that um, next Sunday, uh, due to popular demand, <laughs> um, I am going to do part two <laughs> of um, Unitarian Women in History and how they have changed the world. And so um, feel free to come. We'd love to have you. It's, uh, it, it was a lot of fun last time and surprising. I, I, and I was surprised that I was asked back for that one. <laughs> <laughs> and other announcements? Tuesday. What's happening Tuesday? No. No, nothing, nothing Tuesday. Not, yeah, not still on summer schedule. OK. So we're Has back it? next Sunday. Yeah. Friday uh, at 7.30 at the Old Church is the Dances of Universal Peace. Friday? Friday. This Friday. At what time? 7.30. 7.30? Yeah. And I have flyers for two weeks from now for the workshop on the Saturday, 2 to 4 in this room. Right. And a potluck celebration of our joining the next day dinner at our, at our home uh, at 5 o'clock. And then regular Sunday service with our, we have seven guests coming from out of town that are going to support us. Milton from the international, or the Canadian board, oh. our minister, oh. and a couple people from the choir in New Westminster are coming and going to be oh, singing. And, and they'll help us sing too. Yeah, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> and the potlucks at your place. On the Saturday evening? Yeah. 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 And then we're still working out a, a coffee and tea after. We don't want to be rushed out of here on the Sunday, so we're, I'm trying to organize that, getting the, the uh, co-op. Oh, no. upstairs and be in there. We'll let you know next week how that works. And, and I have one um, celebration, uh, thanks, gratitude that I didn't say earlier in the time and I don't really need to light a candle because many of us are going to be going out to those kinds of events today. But I just want to express gratitude for all the wonderful people who are making food for one another on this Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Thanks everyone for coming. The ones that John, it's just the opposite. The ones they want the they want the arm. Oh, really? I don't know. Primage. Cedar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. So why cedar? Well, because you put wool in cedar boxes. Oh, it's it's yeah. Because wool will be eaten by moths. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you again. Cedar box, but that's uh, yeah. this is wool. Yeah. yeah. Not not yeah. this thing. My wool. That gets you warm. Oh yeah. oh yeah, I know you've got at least three layers that I can see, and I don't know how many are underneath the yellow. And you're not going to find out. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Probably two. Maybe we should guess. guess. Yeah. All right, you can go ahead and guess. Some nice stuff. Some nice stuff. Yeah. Whatever. Well, I see. Does anybody know? Uh, no, no, no. Do you want to go for quick coffee? Because I have a terrible, so much more, more work to do at home. Well, why don't we have a coffee here? Where do you want to go for a coffee? Oh, we have a coffee here. Okay. Are you going to join? Are you going to be part of the joining ceremony? In two weeks, you're going to be a member. Good. Yeah, because you belong here. You're here. You're, you're, you're I'm very good for technical groups and reading emails. It's okay. Yeah, you want to join them. Yeah. Do you want to join them? Yeah. Well, no. Our daily bread doesn't mean dinner. And, and you know where and where it is? Yes, Monday, 5 o'clock. Okay, there you go. Monday, 5 o'clock. And where is it? Our daily bread, which is, uh, you know, where the... Uh, where the old bowling alley oh, used to be, and now it's there. You know where the SEA? Yeah, the share. You know where she is? Is it yeah, the share? The SEA is next to the Yeah, it's in there. Hotel. That's, yeah, next to that yeah, hotel. In that building is where there's a Thanksgiving, community Thanksgiving dinner, and it's free. Everyone's welcome. Is SBCA not in there anymore? They're yes, in there. It's, it's a door before there. Is it from oh. the Best Western? Oh. Yes. Well, yeah, it's in the same building the, as SPCA. Yeah, it's, it's behind, behind the, the hotel. Oh, 
at 5 o'clock tomorrow. Yes, so I was telling you about that. Is it like sleeping in? Yes. There you go. Good, good, good advice. <laughs> <laughs> 